Alrighty, so we'll get started on this topic with a little game. So what we've done here is we've done one text to image generated, uh, one generated image from text to image software, and that is from the Dolly, and one real one. And uh, you can take a look at the photo here, and then I would ask Serena to launch the poll to guess which one is the real image and which one is generated with Dolly 2. Okay, we have about 83%, 90% of participants have selected one. And so you can see the results here. Most of you got it right. The right Obama is the right Obama. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to get out here is that while this technology is pretty scary, you can see that it's still having trouble producing realistic images of faces. You can see the blurriness of the lines and the more cartoonish look of Obama's face. So let's move on to the next one. Excuse me, I have a little animation here. Which one is the real Monet? So we'll give you a second to look at it. And when you're ready, Serena, you can launch the next poll. Okay, almost everybody has answered. One more second for those hesitant few. Great, okay, so it looks like most people selected the left picture and you are correct. So obviously we're going up in scale here, uh, but what we want to um, impress upon you is that Dolly is capable of uh, replicating the impressionist style here with a pretty convincing replica, though you can still see some blurriness and lack of granul granularity in the brush strokes and whatnot. Okay, and then the last one. So take a look, which of these displays a real scenario? Great, thank you for participating. So let's see which one is the real image. So those of you who said the left picture are correct. Um, most of you did pretty well on this little test, but what we want to get across here is that in images such as this where faces are not seen clearly and where there's a sort of monotone muted color range, it's very easy to produce a realistic uh, combat photo. And you can already guess the potential for disinformation here, in particular with things like the war in Ukraine now, you could see how this might be worrying. So with Without further ado, I would pass it over to our research associate, Bia, who will give you an overview of our report, and then we'll get a chance to get a little bit more interactive with questions afterwards. Thank you, Bia. Thank you. Thanks, Heather, for that introduction. Um, I would just ask you for one second. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm very happy to present to you a little bit of our report today. Um, I am Beatriz, I am one of the co-authors of this report. And while I'm gonna do this presentation, I encourage you to please feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, after I present, we will have a little time for some Q&A with me and my colleague Lena that also wrote this report with me. So as Heather already presented, our Disinformator project here focused on the three pillars of disinformation, tools, tactics, and stories. And in our past report, we did map all of the current trends 
uh, within these three pillars, but for this new report, we wanted to dive deeper into the tools. And when we were looking at what is um, emerging and available now, uh, we realized that we were already studying deep, deep fakes, deep fakes, but now we were very interested in fully synthetic content, which could be seen in different formats. It could be a synthetic image, a synthetic video or audio, a synthetic text. Um, However, we were curious about synthetic images specifically because we knew about this text to image generation technology. I think most of you know uh, programs such as DALI that was already mentioned. So this technology works by you writing a text prompt and the model will generate an AI uh, image that it's reflecting the description you just had. So um, I think here what we were curious to know and interest to understand is in the context of this information, um, does this technology enable disinformation actors to create false narrative? Can we create false evidence with this? So what are the threats? What are the risks? We were really um, interested and I think this was our first motivation. So we did wrote the report, what a pixel can tell, text to image generation and its disinformation potential. And today I'm gonna go through some parts of the of the report. I really encourage you to take a read in the full report after this event because it's really complete and very, very nice. And I would also like to thank um, all of the experts that we talked to. They were really, really essential for our research. And you can see here that we have a diversity of experts from this information and forensic field. So I really think the um, their input was very important for us. So without further ado, let's get into the topic. So brief explanation of what is text to image technology. Um, this technology is based on a machine learning model that is trained to produce realistic images from scratch based on a text prompt. What does that mean? It means that the models learn the relationship between words and images. So we train the model to a point that it understands that the word dog should be reflecting the image of a dog. Um, and through this many, many trainings, the models are able to get, for example, here, a very detailed uh, text prompt that we have on the right. And develop an AI image that is very, very accurate and very uh, corresponding to what you just typed. Um, what I wanted to bring here with this example from a model from Google called Party is the development and the advance that we see in these models. Um, these numbers that you see here on top of each picture is the number of parameters that you have in a program. Basically, what you need to know is the more parameters you have, the more accurate you have a picture um, generated from um, this program. And of course, we are interested in knowing um, what are the threats that such programs can, can show us. But to answer that question, we also need to know who has access to this uh, to this type of technology. Of course, we saw in recent years um, development from these programs from big technology companies such as Google, Microsoft with OpenAI. So when we look at from the, in this timeline from Dolly until Party, those are mostly from OpenAI and Google, and we see they are without open access and with restrictions and safeguards. What does that mean? It means that you cannot go to Dolly or to party and type, for example, Joe Biden holding a gun. Uh, this program will have a filter that understands that Joe Biden is a high is a name of a high profile um, actor and it will not allow you to create such pictures. However, we are in an open source arena where models get replicated and proliferated peripheralate, excuse me, quickly. And we see, for example, a recent model, a recent program, sorry, called Stable Diffusion that is open access and has no restrictions or safeguards. And the images that are generated there are very, very good and very accurate. So we start to think that this could be a more dangerous reality that we are facing. So in our report, when we were looking um, and we performed a threat and risk assessment, our conclusion was that in the short run, we are not seeing those risks to be so real. And that is basically because these information campaigns are still very dynamic and fast. So the perpetrators or the disinformation actors, they are not willing to put a lot of effort and a lot of time into learning this technology, into learning how to create um, these accurate pictures and so on, um, especially because people are still deceived with cheap fakes, with very traditional means of cutting, editing, manipulating pictures. We are still believing in that. So they don't have the incentive to learn such um, uh, how a technology works. 
However, in the long run, we see a little bit more of issues. So for example, combination of synthetic media, what happens when we have a synthetic text that is the text prompt that we use to have a synthetic image. So this full automatization could be very problematic. Um, as I already mentioned, creation of misleading images of public figures. We also have the diffusion of biases. So this models, they are based on data sets of images that we already have online. So we, we could have gender biases, racial biases, and so on. And we see a diffusion of those. So most likely, if you type CEO, you would see a male figure. But if you type nurse, you could see a female figure. So all of those risks and threats uh, we are expecting to see in the long run. The question of preparedness, how prepared we are. As a society, I would say we are not very prepared. Um, we are still very heavily dependent on digital literacy, how much we can recognize online, how much we can um, tell if this image or content is true or not. So, and as I said, we are still very uh, susceptible to cheap fakes, to basic manipulation of content. Um, so we would say that we are not very prepared for these sophisticated technologies. The question of how technically prepared we are, I think one key aspect here is the detection mechanism and provenance technology comes a lot. I think we will see this in the debate, but um, basically here provenance technology is about tracing the orange of that manipulated content. So um, one example could be digital watermarks. So that kind of shifts the task uh, in the text of verification from whoever is receiving to the producer of that visual information. Um, and regarding the social media platforms, when we were looking at all of the policies they have, we didn't find any that tackles specifically this issue. So quite interesting to see that they talk about manipulated content, but not specifically text to image. What is currently being done? Well, we have the side of policymakers, civil society. Of course, I think most of you know there's two very important proposed legislations in the EU, the Digital Services Act and Artificial Intelligence Act. Uh, and we also have the civil society with a range of initiatives um, tackling this issue, uh, for example, advocating in this proposed legislation, um, asking for better um, definitions of concepts, asking for better transparency of how um, the categories in those legislations work. So we really see here uh, civil society playing a big role. So we have this very complex reality of models being developed and getting um, more and more um, accurate with the images. We see that we are not prepared as a society. Uh, social media platforms are not talking specifically about this issue. Um, what could be, what should be done next? That was our question when we came up with some recommendations. Um, I won't go through all of them. I just would like to highlight a few because I think a lot will come in the debate, but we divided our recommendations in three categories. The first one being increased protection mechanism. And here, what we really would like to see is this binding and standardized code of conduct for the AI service providers. So meaning that not only if we say that digital watermarks in those pictures are important, this shouldn't be a choice for them, but it should be an obligation that they need to put those watermarks there. Um, we also think that this development of a trusting and cooperative relationship between regulators and the AI, AI industry is very, very important to create this type of minimum standards that we want to see out there for when this technology becomes a real threat. and. The second category is about the platform transparency. We really would like to encourage this more. So we don't know much about the enforcement, uh, the policy enforcement of these platforms. Why is a content taken down when another content is not taken down? So uh, we really think that sh they should be more transparent about that. And lastly, we really, really believe that we need to go beyond the technical solutions that I just presented here. So I would like to highlight here the second recommendation that is this shift from debunking to pre-bunking. So when we are talking about fact-checking and debunking, um, that means that the information was already out there and those that were to believe in that false content already saw it and already made their minds. Um, so pre-bunking is about educating audiences to discern and to be careful with the content. So we really think this should be a key, key point and something that we need to work more um, together to tackle this issue. This was a very fast and brief um, introduction to the, to the report. As I said, uh, the report is very complete and we have more and more details about everything that I said here. But I will 
open now the floor to you to share your questions and also to be joined by my colleague Lena to answer some of your questions. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Perhaps we can start with the very first question. I can see in the chat that there's a question by Samira um, asking, I assume um, for the difference between cheap fakes and deep fakes exactly. Um, I can take over Bea if uh, you don't mind. So the general difference between those two is the level of sophistication. If we have cheap fakes, um, we usually use very traditional and conventional means of manipulating media content that can be cropping um, a media content that can be slowing down or speeding up video material. Um, for deep fakes that is different, we apply a higher level of technical sophistication. So these are produced by artificial intelligence. That is the main difference that the one goes for the conventional methods, the other one uses AI. I can also see a comment uh, that was made by Samira that we do need digital literacy training as a society, but also media and journalists. I agree 100%. I think there needs to be an upgrade in training um, to actually detect fake information, false information to understand where um, the content is coming from. Um, to have more training on fact-checking and also to be able to differentiate between synthetic content and actually truly authentic content. I also see here a comment from Eric. Um, culture, social media business, uh, business imperatives encourage participation by rewarding rapid formation of of often uninformed opinion potentially feeding spreading fake media <laughs> any comment on that um i don't know if lena you have um any comment but i'm trying to just read again current participation by rewarding rapid formation yeah i think um it's true i think the there is this um rapid spread of fake news because it gets more attention of people and uninformed opinions um uh, do feed that, but I am. I think this was one key issue that we saw regarding the um, social media businesses is that they talk about manipulated media in a very general way, and it, as I said, it's not very clear how they how they tackle down a content. And I think this is an issue that we still face being text to image generated images or not. I think fake media on social media it's still not very clear how sometimes the content is taken down. Um, I don't know, Lena, if you have any further comment about this, um, the social media businesses. No, nothing to add. Thanks, Bea. I can also see a question there um, by Angel or Angle. Um, if there are any laws in place for those that will utilize a person's face without their permission. Um, I think they are not in place now. There are lots of standards and um, guidelines on the platforms, um, whether content is synthetic or not, and whether it actually abuses those guidelines and um, standards and codes of conduct. There is currently a lot of work, especially in the European Union, on the Artificial Intelligence Act that will try to differentiate between different kinds of um, high risk and low risk artificial intelligence. Um, even though the definition is quite vague at the moment, we hope that this will actually serve as a basis to actually define whether something is used without one's permission. Um, but that would be my answer. If you have anything else said, Bea, then feel free to jump in. Nothing to add, thanks. I see one here. What do you expect from the European Freedom of the Media Plan? EU Commission table the other day. I don't know, Lena, if you have any input. 
I, to be honest, I don't have um, a lot of knowledge about that yet. Me neither, to be honest. I can see there's, there's another question by Anita. Um, is there anything in the report on the potential impact of text to image generation technology on the open source human rights investigation? I'm not quite sure if I understand this question correctly. Um, there is a lot of content um, with respect to how human rights organizations um, can react and what they're currently already doing to tackle the issue, not specifically in terms of open source investigations. I just want to also highlight to those that I'm maybe not with the chat open, but we have Daniel Weimat from Twitter here that just shared also a link about how Twitter um, approach manipulated media and the criteria. I think, um, Daniel, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I can't stay for too long. I just wanted to provide some extra context. Uh, I put down that link there where you can read a bit about our approach to SAM synthetic and manipulated media. And you can also see three criteria on which we take enforcement action. So the first one being, is it altered in any way, obviously? <laughs> Um, which takes a long time to check out whether there is technical signals for some kind of change in that image or video. The second one, is it being shared deceptively? And then the third one is, um, does it create some kind of grand confusion or does it create harm? So for example, there's even a more detailed uh, report that I'll need to figure out and then send it here um, with a table on, on which it says, for example, if it's deceptively altered and deceptively um, deceptively uh, disseminated, then uh, this might, for example, justify a label. In other cases, it will even be taken down. So there's a quite detailed, actually, um, 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 report on that. But maybe just for, for context, for example, the picture on strawberries, they would probably not be taken down or even labeled just because they are artificially altered, but they wouldn't, I guess, be shared deceptively and wouldn't really create offline harm. But on the other hand, what you shared on uh, the military pictures that would very much be taken down or labels. And in the Ukraine case, we actually labeled more than 6.6 thousand videos. I mean, these investigations take a long time. So this is obviously not something that's done within the first 30 minutes that a video pops up. But um, yeah, just giving a bit of background if you want to read more about that. That's, that's that. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and we have, I think, time for maybe one more question um, from Mika. Hi, Mika. Can you talk a bit more about how you imagine provenance standards being implemented to address this problem? Um, maybe I will give it the floor to Lena if you want to tackle that. Thanks, Bea. I think we will most likely touch upon this question in the panel discussion. Um, so I would probably keep this one for the panel discussion because we do have some experts here who have much more knowledge about provenance technology than I do. So I would say I'll keep that for later. Thanks. Um, we have one more comment. What do you think will happen to um, GDPR in regard to data processing rules? How principles of protection of personal data would apply to AI processed data on social media? I think that is a very good question that um, we did not touch upon, I, I would say, in our report, also due to the limitations that we had within the topic. But I think some another person had already talked, like asked about this um, with the data privacy. Um, this is something that, of course, it's a concern. And I think um, this is also why many um, CSOs push the legislation to be more specific or to have more um, content regarding this specific technology, because to the point that if we could create something uh, with the face of somebody, of course, that is very problematic. Uh, we have those apps nowadays, those face uh, swap apps that are very um, also against the data privacy law. So um, I'm not really sure how that would impact. I've this is a good question for a follow-up um, report on, on our topic. Lena, do you have anything to add to that? I'm not sure. If, I'm sorry I couldn't answer. Um, it's a very tricky question, but very well done. <laughs> Thanks, Bea. Okay, I think uh, we 
are with the time for the Q and A, so I will pass it back, or I will keep Lena here to um, start the moderation of the debate. Uh, I posted the link of the report here in the chat, everybody. So yeah, let's enjoy the panelists now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bea. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. We have seen during the presentation that text image generation models introduce some opportunities, um, but many risks with a severe potential impact on how we perceive the world for better and for worse. The question is, do we need to be worried about its disinformation potential? And that's one of the questions we would like to touch upon this afternoon. Here with me are four wonderful experts who know a lot about advances in AI, synthetic media, and manipulated content. Let me introduce you to our very first panelist, um, Claire Leibovitz. Claire heads the AI and Media Integrity Program at Partnership on AI. Under Claire's leadership, the AI and Media Integrity team works on projects at the intersection of AI, information integrity, and public discourse. Current work centers on synthetic and manipulated content, methods for conveying disinformation to online audiences, and content targeting and ranking systems. She also oversees partnership on AI's AI and Media Integrity Steering Committee, which is a formal body of partners of partnership on AI that um, work to develop and advise projects that strengthen online public discourse. Claire, thank you so much for being here today. Next up, I'd like to welcome Sharon Allen. Sharon is an award-winning creative technologist, artist, and researcher. She is the media technologist for Witness, a video and human rights organization which helps people use video and technology to defend human rights. Lovely to have you here today, Sharon. Our next panelist is Andy Parsons. Andy is the Senior Director of Adobe's Content Authenticity Initiative, which is creating open technologies for a future of verifiable, authentic content of all kinds. With collaborators across hardware, software, publishing, and social platforms, the Content Authenticity Initiative is empowering creators with secure provenance. Andy also oversees and represents Adobe um, on the steering committee of the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA, which is the standards development organization that Adobe co-founded. Great to have you here on the panel today, Andy. And last but not least, um, we have Jan Bayer, my colleague. Jan is the Digital Democracy Research Coordinator at Democracy Reporting International. In his role, he monitors and analyzes political discourse, as well as the use of technology and digital tools for disinformation during significant political events. Jan, always a pleasure. Thank you all so much for being here and for speaking on this panel. I know it's very early for some of you, especially for those of you who are in the States. So I'm even more grateful that you found the time to talk about text to image generation and its disinformation potential. Before we start, I want to encourage the audience to ask questions as we go. There will be a question and answer session after the panel, but feel free to drop burning questions in the chat while we speak so I can also properly address them during the conversation. Also, as a quick remark for the speakers, if you would like to react to a comment one of the other panelists had made, just raise your hand and then you can unmute yourself and I'll give you the floor. Okay, perfect. Without further ado, let's jump right into this, shall we? Um, I'd like to start with a warm up question that I'm sure lots of members of the audience have thought about when they stumble upon AI generated imagery by text -to image generation tools such as Dolly and Crayon. That being, what was your first thought that came into your mind when you saw pictures that were created with Crayon, formerly known as Dali Mini, the tool with which everything started? Let's start with you, Claire. I think you said Claire, yes? Yes, I said okay. Claire. Sure. Welcome, and thank you for having me. And it's good to see um, Andy, Sharon, Jan, nice to meet you. Um, well, being that I work in this space, I will be a little bit boring and say I felt a little bit that the cat was out of the bag and a lot of our work needed to pick up the pace. However, I also felt a little bit heartened by the fact that many of the institutions like OpenAI and others had been asking questions to artists, to 
external stakeholders like those in civil society for quite some time in anticipation of the broader implications, which we'll get to later. Um, so first, I wanted to give it a try myself. I encourage anyone who likes to intellectually engage with ideas about the meaning of AI art to actually play around with these tools, to try a prompt like a corgi on the moon in the style of Monet, um, to try and break these systems um, in the case of ones that actually have guardrails. But my first inclination was, won't it be really fascinating that the entire AI debate that we've been having in responsible AI is going to use kind of this really ubiquitous visceral use case as a lens. So not only in its disinformation potential, but also in its meaning on the future of work and what it means for artists in terms of the ethicality of these tools, what it means for bias in data sets, and what it means to train a model in a fair way. And I thought it was just a really potent, powerful, um, creative, but also potentially um, disarming <laughs> use case for thinking about responsible AI. Thank you so much. That's very interesting and very interesting in inputs. What about you, Andy? What were your first thoughts? Um, I'm gonna steal Claire's thunder a little bit and echo what she said. I, I would say, Maybe on top of what Claire said, my very first thought was also, gosh, this is awfully cool and um, very useful for creativity. I think until we had my until I had seen a second data point with Dolly and then Dolly 2, um, it was hard to assess the rate of quality increase with these tools. So I'll jump to Dolly 2 or Dolly and some of the other things and now stable diffusion and what's in open source. Um, I think the rate of improvement is what's alarming here, not the existence of these tools. And when we saw that second data point, I think, you know, my, my second thought, if I can share a second thought, was um, we're not ready um, as a society and as purveyors of technology, um, Adobe included, content authenticity included, we need to pick up the pace. Um, and that was um, a disarming thought and a, a sobering thought. And um, we'll talk more about how we're doing that. But I think we have a lot of work to do. Thanks, Andy. Does that resonate with you, Sharon? Oh yeah, uh, I will definitely echo that. But uh, first, thank you for having me. And uh, I think I had similar thought to Andy, like uh, I was in early experiments in 2018 with Runway when we did text to image. And it was only on a, a data set of quarter million photos. Uh, so I was, my first thought was like, oh my God, that's progressed so much. So I thought, cool. And then I thought, oh no. <laughs> I think I realized like uh, we're moving to a more complex like visual creation world much faster than I was anticipating. So I was like alarmed by that. Um, but also like the cool because like at Witness, we believe in the, the power of audiovisual without that uh, Witness would not be uh, alive, right? Like we, the power of audiovisual can like protect and defend human rights. And there is a lot of like uh, 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 the democracy that uh, audiovisual provide us. So, yeah, we believe in the potential future for a creative uh, uh, advocacy that the like synthetic media can do for social justice, but we need to fight for that future. So I think that's kind of thoughts. Thanks a lot. And last but not least, Jan, I know there's quite some research bias there because you've done a lot of research on it, but thinking back, what was your first thought? Yeah, I think um, you're already pointing out in this direction. I think I had the diametrically opposed um, impression that first I thought, okay, wow, that's the beginning of the end. And uh, only afterwards uh, kind of identified the more creative potential, but that might have been because we were just writing on our report on uh, disinformation tools. So I think I was quite primed in that regard. Thanks a lot. So if I sum it up, the bottom line is it's a really cool tool. Um, it's quite powerful, but also can be quite scary. Crayon, the one that I mentioned, is obviously one of the first open access models that um, was used um, quite widely and that still produces rudimentary imagery compared to a lot of the other models, such as DALI2 and the diffusion model, Stable Diffusion, the newest high quality open access version. I'd like to jump forward in time and imagine that text to image generation is by then fully developed. We saw during the icebreaker session, there are still some glitches here and there, but we assume that technology advances over time. And that would then imply that we are living in a world we, where we can no longer differentiate between fact and fiction online. What do you as the experts on the panel think um, the social impact will be? Do we need to be worried, Andy? 
Uh, I would say yes, we, we do need to be worried. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if this is a, a tricky topic. I suspect we all agree that we need to be worried and the question turns to what do we do about it? So, you know, a, a post-truth world is something that a lot of uh, folks on the panel and a lot of uh, others have written about. You know, I think we're moving there at an exponential pace. Um, and as we've all said in, the, in our first response, we're not ready. Um, I also think that detection, uh, you know, visible watermarking, even invisible watermarking are things that are easily circumvented. Um, and I think, you know, to some degree, we are putting too much faith in traditional methods while the, the, the techniques for creating synthetic media are rocketing ahead um, at, you know, I think never before seen rates and huge motivations, including economic motivations, the motivations of state actors to make them go even faster. Um, and as I said in my first response, yeah, we really need to catch up and speed up the pace. So we should be concerned, but I like, um, you know, witnesses sort of mantra, prepare, don't panic. I think it's too easy to panic. So when I say we should be worried, I don't wanna instill panic. Um, I want to instill, you know, careful thought and quick action. Um, and that's, that's what I'm focused on and know others on the panel are focused on as well. Perfect, thank you so much. Well, you've already mentioned witness. Um, Shirin, is this something that you would agree with? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm i sure I'll talk later more about the Prepared on Panic initiative, but like uh, I kind of agree with uh, Andy, like uh, the technical infrastructure are completely different and we need to catch up with that. Uh, like you mentioned open source tools. So the open source ideology is beautiful uh, for transparency, for access, for openness. Uh, but at the same time, uh, democ democratization of tools also like need to have the responsibility uh, that comes with democracy, like defend who we, who is in the table, who we protect. Uh, so I'll say the implication is like scaling a lot, like all what we see, what like we mentioned with the report, all the shallow, cheap fakes, uh, deep fakes, uh, all those problems are going to be just in a huge scale, uh, racial bias, gender-based violence. Um, so yeah, moving to pre-bank then debank uh, is kind of like a part of like the social implication. And um, I think like I read yesterday that uh, Dali mentioned that they, the content floating, like there is 1.5 million users uh, publishing 2 million images a day. So all that, uh, all the same problem with just in like a continent floods of scale, yeah. Jan. What do you think will be the social impact? Yeah, I think in large part, I can only resonate with the previous uh, speakers have said. I mean, um, the the fact that so far a lot of disinformation campaigns are rather rooted in kind of quantity rather than quality. I mean, if we look, for example, at Russian disinformation campaigns, I think this is their their prime prime um, uh, signpost that they that they never look out whether the quality is right, but rather whether the quantity is right. If they are given the tools that they can on top of creating quantity, creating quality, then um, I think the, the sphere of disinformation will be quite heavily affected by it. And I think Bea also pointed out, I mean, the aspect that this technology allows for auto for full automa automation where we where we combine kind of like artificial text with artificial images that can uh, like create a common stream of uh, disinformation narratives, um, of course, is, is a very worrying sign. I think there are maybe some hopeful indicators. I mean, I think uh, one of our respondents in the report talked about that the younger generation of, of people that is maybe more familiar with computer games, with virtual realities, maybe they're more equipped for some of these developments. Maybe they are, they are more prone to, cap to capture kind of like virtual realities that we are creating with the, this kinds of technologies. And maybe there are some hopeful signs that we should also uh, look out for in the debates that we not only uh, focus on on the ne negative aspects, but maybe the the nascent um, to, uh, nascent roots of maybe some some more positive trends. Thank you, Jan. I see that Claire already mentioned that she can reply to one of the comments in sure. the chat. And I'll preface by saying, Lena, I think at the beginning you said you were going to start our debate and we're all agreeing with one another in terms of the, <laughs> the narrative around prepare, don't panic. And while I think that's true, I will also say there are semantics that I think we probably all can debate. And I, I just want to echo this post-truth world to kind of the 
reiterate the measured stance that Andy took and the Prepare Don't Panic initiative took. This is not new, as many of us know. We have had disinforming content. We have had manipulative media for a long time. The realm of debate often warrants the fact that it's increasingly technically sophisticated and also thinking about how human behavior and abilities to keep up, keep pace with that. An area I will add is not only the technical innovation, which includes both you know, the progress of generation, but also mitigations like detection and even provenance infrastructure, which is an inventive solution technically and is novel compared to what we've dealt with um, you know, in the past with manipulated media. There's also questions of our laws and regulations and the domains that it implicates and if those can keep up and if that's new for this post-truth world. Um, so a lot of people have mentioned copyright in a witness meeting, I will say someone talked about, do we need a right to digital dignity in terms of our likeness being depicted in some of this material? Sure, it's true that a photograph of Claire Leibowitz could have existed in the 1900s, but the ease of access to that and its, its incorporation into a data set makes that different. So I'm interested in kind of, and you know, I didn't describe what PAI is, but I think a lot about the different stakeholders, legal, technology, um, you know, end users, artists who are implicated in this conversation. And I think that's kind of this new domain with which we can think about a solution space is by working with all of those areas. So in terms of Congress, there is a deep fake task force act that was presented by two, um, I think one Democratic and one Republican congressman, someone hold me honest with that. So there is legislative movement. And then a lot of it is also domain specific, which I do think makes sense, right? Because uh, thinking about truth holistically and the, the medium as the mode of regulation can be difficult when you're also thinking about different use cases that have implications that might vary, ranging from satire, which I know Witness is working on, to um, you know, lewd sexual imagery, which is disinforming in a really you know, distinct way. So this is not to suggest that I disagree with everyone, just to throw out a few areas of you know, how do we solve this, what's new um, about this realm, and how is legislative action and also just more normative action going to help um, deal with this particular moment in time that might be distinct from earlier image manipulation moments we've grappled with. Thank you so much, Claire. I can see a couple of questions coming in already in the chat. So I would probably move the direction of the conversation more to the technical solutions and prevention mechanisms because I can see a couple of questions in the chat. And um, I was wondering, there is a question about the alternatives to digital watermarks. Um, so maybe I can give the floor to Andy already. Um, and speaking from a tech perspective, what, what can we do? What is already being done to actually prevent the misuse of synthetic media? Um, yeah, great topic. And I'll, I could probably spend the rest of our time together talking about it. I'll, I will not do that. Um, I'll try to give you a brief overview of my point of view, and I think a very promising direction that um, we work on in the C2PA, as was mentioned in the intro, that's a standards organization that Adobe helped found. Um, and then the thing that I do in the CAI at Adobe is um, make these tools and this approach as accessible as possible through free, you know, permissive licensing open source. So with a standard and open source, um, we do have a, a good chance, I think, and I'm optimistic about getting this technology adopted. Now, let me describe what it is. Um, so, you know, watermarks are a way to indicate that um, there's some low bandwidth information that's associated with the media. And in theory, it should be inextricable from the media itself. But in practice, even using the most state of the art, um, invisible watermarking, uh, steganography techniques, it's pretty straightforward to remove those things. So. Um, I'm not opposed to them. I think they can be very helpful. I think they can be used in conjunction with uh, true provenance standards, which I'll, I'll get to in just a sec. Um, but I think we we often overemphasize their robustness. Um, we also have to consider, you know, if something is watermarked and then someone makes a derivative work of that thing, it doesn't become truer as it moves through its various stages of manipulation. It probably becomes more deceitful or diff more difficult to understand. And when you put watermarks on top of watermarks, things can become very confusing. And therefore, what we really need is this notion of provenance, which is effectively a chain, not a blockchain, although it could be, um, but a chain of linked information about how something was made and how it, um, how it came from origination, perhaps from a camera, in the case of news uh, imagery or video, 
all the way to your eyeballs on social media, for example, and everything in between. So what we work on with provenance and the way the technology works um, in a little more detail is we don't rely on watermarks. Instead, we rely on cryptographic uh, sealed sign data that's attached to the media itself. Um, it's not necessarily attached by watermarks. It's attached uh, by a very straightforward method of, of hashing um, or checksumming. Um, it's metadata. If it's removed, there are ways to recover it via fingerprinting. Um, you'll see some of that coming from Adobe in the next few months. Um, and the idea is to the extent that is physically possible without violating the physical laws of the universe, that data will always be attached to that particular piece of media. Should it be manipulated, um, additional metadata will be chained onto that provenance and you'll eventually have um, this full story about where something came from. Of course, uh, without violating concepts of privacy and of course, uh, safety, especially when it comes to journalists in conflict regions. So that's the basic idea. I'm happy to talk more about exactly how it works. Um, but you know, this, I just wanna mention a couple more things. One is the trust model in this approach is based on humans and organizations. It's not based on pixels and technology. Um, and that means that ultimately my opinion and, and kind of the, the motivating um, principles of these organizations that I work with to make this real is that if you want to consider trust, you have to know where something came from. And at the end of the day, I do think it's a fool's errand to think that we as technologists can get past the notion that if something fits your worldview, you are likely to share it, whether it's true or not. You know, we may, you know, Claire and others may have a different opinion on that. I'm a little pessimistic as a technologist that that's something we can address. And I'm quite certain we can't address it in the time frame that we can address this notion of um, trust in people and organizations. So if you trust the BBC and we can do something very trivially simple with um, the CAI approach, which is to say, if this purports to come from the BBC, can I know cryptographically verifiably that it did originate at the BBC? And the answer is yes, we can do that now. I think you'll see it rolling out over the next few years. Um, and then we can extend that to social media going forward in the publication pipeline and all the way back to capture in cameras in a very secure way. Um, so that's that's the basic idea. And then the second thing I wanna mention is that um, this is starting to happen now. So this is not theoretical. Had we talked together in this group a year ago, um, we would have probably said, these are interesting ideas. There's a standard, but a standard is a tome of a hundred pages of technical esoteric content. Um, there is open source, there are people adopting this, um, and I think we will see it and, you know, we'll see if my optimism is warranted over the next two years, not, not 10 years. Thank you so much, Andy, for this very thorough explanation of authentication at the point of creation. Um, we talked about the, the tech perspective here. I also wanted to ask Sharon from a human rights lens, how you think human rights organizations are prepared for the potential threat that text image generation poses. If there's anything up your sleeve that you're currently doing to tackle the issue. Yeah, so it was mentioned a few times, a uh, um, witnesses leading initiative prepared on panic since 2018, where we are working on a few different areas but mainly what we are doing, we are bringing global perspectives. So we are doing global convenient and making sure global voices are being heard and shaping the technology that is being developed. So part of our collaboration with C2PA is uh, um, leading the uh, harm and risk assessment when we are looking at like global uh, understanding of a problem like privacy and uh, access or like Wi-Fi connection or like other types of technical aspects. And technical solution are one thing, like you said, and they are important, like traceable technology will, is an honest technology. So it's also linking to how uh, we can bring human rights framework to the development of technology. And I think what ZDPA is doing is, uh, is very unique in that sense. And I hope it's gonna reflect more in standard developments. Um, but we also need to think about uh, how we are also developing capacity alongside those value, kind of like what Claire is leading and how we're understanding like a code of conduct and, and, uh, and what it means for like, not just the big tech, but also like independent and uh, startups and small businesses. Um, so what we are doing in Witness, we are looking also at like, uh, what does it mean detection access and how we can develop like a mechanism for equity uh, detection uh, that we can like escalate from community leaders, from journalists, from fact checkers to uh, media forensic in a timely manner to debunk uh, real deep fake or claims of deep fakes or media manipulation and kind of bring back the response 
Uh, we're also looking, Claire mentioned it, and the, the gray areas of uh, media manipulation, the satire, freedom of, of expression, and a lot of elements that comes from that are, are like um, elements that comes back with like a parameter for accountability uh, about consent, uh, what does labeling mean, and we're looking at how we can uh, reframe labeling, how we can reframe this stigma around labeling and make it part of like technolo technology innovation, but also like a social innovation, accessibility innovation. Uh, so those are kind of things we are looking at. And then we are also like um, looking ahead and AI productions and not just looking at text to image, but considering text to video that is already being uh, uh, teased around and will be launched soon. And uh, what does it mean in like uh, immersive experiences, the metaverse that we all preparing ourselves, the VR, AR, deep fakes in that sense. Um, and then uh, just to highlight again, it comes from the just joking, from labeling, but, and it came from the chat too. What is like, how can we rethink about framework for consent and digital uh, dignity, like Claire mentioned, but like uh, how we can uh, develop opt in, not just opt out, but opt in, framework where I can like, I need to give my consent for someone to use my image in the data set if it's like for copyright use or for uh, uh, protections and not just like need to opt out out of those data sets. And then uh, uh, how we can develop a more uh, mechanism for like people to have direct approach to companies. So those are kind of things we're looking at. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights. Um, we've touched upon some effective solutions um, from the technical side, but also from the human rights lens. I do want to touch a little bit upon regulation because that was also mentioned in the chat because most of these models do not really have a lot of regulation. Um, the closed access ones, so to speak, they do have some, they apply self-regulation. Um, the open access ones, do not adhere to any moderation whatsoever. So I was wondering, Claire and Jan, do you think this is enough? Or in other words, what needs to be done in this regard? I can maybe start. Um, and first I'll share a little bit. It's not capital R regulation, it's norm setting about some of the work that we've been doing, but it is a complement to a lot of movement we have seen in the policy domain. And something to name at the top is you know, I work within the AI world, but also it intersects, obviously, per this conversation with the disinfo world and both the EU code of practice on disinformation, which is, you know, agnostic to if it's deep fake or not purely, it's about disinforming content and the EU AI Act, I think, implicate this area. So looking to both the disinformation world purely and the AI regulation coming down the pike, that's more holistic than just text to, text to image generators, for example, and their disinforming impact is important. But as a prelude to that, um, something that's really interesting that you were highlighting, Lena, is kind of regulating the kind of infrastructure providers. So like the open AIs or the stability diffusions, right? Or the places where there's, you know, opportunity or infrastructure for people to create. But we have been thinking about creating norms kind of across the pipeline of who's involved and the institutions involved so that there can be a degree of introspection, ethicality, and responsibility from kind of many layers. And what I mean by that, and obviously as PAI, which is a multi-stakeholder organization, and we've worked very closely, I'll shout out Adobe and Witness are close friends of the partnership in that they're very participatory in our work. But we've been interested in not only thinking about norms for those who build the technology and infrastructure and basis for generating AI art, but also creators themselves, synthetic media startups may be a little bit different than, you know, an open AI and how they craft, grasp these issues and what we would want them to do. So too might the distributors like a, a platform, a Facebook, a Twitter, who maybe get that remixed content on their platform, which maybe got consent at the kind of creator level, but it didn't get consent to be distributed, let's say, how does that implicate kind of the, the regulatory regime that we build around you know, this content? And how might a platform's distribution vary from that of a news organization who deals more with a different type of content? So just to add some layers of complexity to what type of, I'm gonna keep using regulation for just general norm setting, but what type of policy we want 
And at PAI for the past year, um, we don't plan for this to be kind of um, a mechanism of accountability, but we wanted to put out a code of conduct derived from work with over 50 institutions across that spectrum I've described and including end users, frankly, and affected stakeholders who might actually encounter some of this material, which has sounded integral in this conversation to kind of figuring out at the end of the day what people trust, to put forth a normative suite of guidelines that would be a complement to emerging regulation, which is inevitable, and also be an opportunity for things to kind of evolve over time. Because as you've described, we need something discrete now for audiovisual information that seems real to the naked eye. But as the metaverse evolves, as technology gets more complex, um, as there are more people, you know, and it's not that open source is bad, but shunting the rules, that will need to shift over time. Um, so the short answer is regulation should be very, very, very well versed in the realities of what's going on across this pipeline and understanding the technology, bridging that is super important to us. And in the interim, we think there's value in kind of the community coalescing around a set of ethical norms, responsibility that are concrete for us to be able to um, deal with the challenge ourselves too. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing also the synthetic media code of conduct. I know- I'll your feedback. I'm gonna link to it in case anyone wants to weigh in. Please do, please do. I know that um, Sharon, you need to run if I'm not mistaken. Um, so thank you so much for participating and for representing Witness, but all of the other panelists are still staying um, and are available for questions from the audience. But Jan, I would also like to give you the floor very quickly to answer the question I previously asked. Yeah, I think um, I, I would like to resonate what Claire said in terms of that we need to look exactly with regulations, um, what we're doing because um, I think when, when I first saw that um, DALI 2, for example, was restricting who they were giving access to in terms of like who can access their platform, I was at first quite happy saying that, okay, this is, this is good that the platforms are doing this. And a second thought, I actually realized maybe that's not the best idea that platforms get to decide this because it actually shifts the power balance to the companies. And that should not be the case. Those are technologies that can fundamentally reshift the public discourse and it shouldn't be companies that could decide who can use their APIs and who doesn't, because it is it gives commercial actors too much too much power in the game. So I think we we need to really look even even regulation that at first looked maybe as uh, something valuable might have to be reassessed. And um, I think uh, we like this aspect of self-regulation that the companies could self-regulate. Um, I think we wouldn't also uh, let I I don't know match match companies uh, make fire hazard regulations. So I think there needs to be a central authority or so that looks and, and um, yeah, gives guidance there and gives regulation. So. Thanks a lot, Jan. I think with respect to the timing, I would probably close the panel and open the floor to any other questions that have been put in the chat. But first of all, I wanted to say thank you for your very insightful inputs and valuable contributions. I will have a look at questions in the chat and then feel free to unmute yourself whenever you think um, you're, you're willing to answer that question. Let me see. Okay, one of the very first questions was a question for Andy. It was about Adobe's neural filters in Photoshop. Um, and Eric said that it offers very easy on ramp to convincing fakes from existing images. Um, it's a great tool for artistic purposes, but how to mitigate the harm? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think if you pay attention to Adobe Max this year, you'll, you'll hear more about positioning around AI tools. Um, and it, it, in general, and this is not just Adobe, but purveyors of tools for creators, um, be they automated or manual or catering to uh, artisans or marketers or what have you, um, you know, we have to think about how to balance access to these kinds of tools with responsibility. And if I can comment on the previous question on legislation, I think, um, I agree. I'm, I'm looking for topics of debate here, not finding them. Um, I agree with both of my co-panelists. Like, I think something like the partnership on AI's work is almost like a meta code of ethics. And if the best thing that comes out of it is a notion of the definition of ethical behavior, that will be a huge step forward. And if that can filter into some normative um, common aspects of regulation, 
uh, across cultures and geographies, um, that will be a massive step forward. And companies like Adobe and others uh, have to understand what those ethical guidelines are. And let's not develop all of our own separate ethical guidelines that won't always be in harmony. Um, in terms of neural filters specifically, you know, I can tell you that um, you know Adobe has a a large group of experts um, looking at ethical standards and uh, ethical AI in particular. And this is the kind of thing that I think is inevitable. And you know, we are the purveyors of like the most used and I would say the most sophisticated tools for for professional artists in these regards. Um, Neural Filters does subscribe to content authenticity. There's a feature in Photoshop called Content Credentials um, that's live now. Um, and you know, the idea is if you turn it on and you want to behave responsibly in our, our purview, um, you will effectively show your work and say this was used. This is not an untouched photograph. This is an image of a person whose age has been altered or whose emotional um, portrayal has been changed in some way, or even whose gender has been changed, the kinds of powerful things you can do. And that goes to our, our general feeling that transparency, if not the answer, is a very critical component of a foundation and trust to say, let's not preclude use of these tools and uh, certainly let's not preclude technology companies from creating them because they have incredible power for, for creative people. But let's make sure that they're used responsibly and our, our notion of what responsible use looks like is to show your work and declare that these tools have been used and let downstream um, consumers of, of that art or that content make up their own minds about whether it's trustworthy and how to regard it. Thanks a lot, Andy. I can see another question, which is more about the cybersecurity issue and cybersecurity concerns. What do you as panelists think are the cybersecurity concerns of text to image generation? Well, maybe Anyone? if I can, I think, um, I mean, this aspect that we've been talking about kind of um, that in how far you can represent a face um, is actually a key element um, where if that will be possible in the future, I think where um, cybersecurity concerns could be, become decisive, especially for kind of like um, uh, detection mechanisms or access mechanisms where facial facial features and so on um, play a role where you can access certain elements. I mean, the same way that, I mean, uh, synthetic voice could become an become a, um, access point for specific, specific security systems. So I think we are not there yet, but um, there is a is a huge cybersecurity concern in in this regard when the technology becomes more advanced. Yeah, and I might go a little bit further um, and say, you know, the cybersecurity implication is vast. If, if I think this what's happening um, means that we need to revisit most or all of our cybersecurity procedures, especially when it comes to the welfare of employees of companies of the general public. Um, and that means, you know, that may mean, um, you know, more uh, revealing identity concerns, like understanding where something came from and what tools are being used. For example, NVIDIA and others are pioneering extremely deep, exciting technology around video conferencing, you know, to lower the amount of bandwidth used. Um, how is that done? You know, by using 3D models and learning algorithms in real time um, so that you can send keyframes of my face right now, but everything in between those keyframes uh, is being interpreted or inferred. Um, that's incredible. That, could, that is amazing. Just like all of this, right? There's a theme emerging here, which is these technologies are amazingly accretive for humanity, but they have the opposite and maybe more perilous price of uh, falling into the wrong hands. So when it comes to cybersecurity, I think it's generally um, the posture of security experts that we should assume the worst. And in this case, I just want to amplify that. Uh, we should assume that people are going to use these in subtle, increasingly uh, undetectable ways and we need to you know get ready for that so there i think there's a lot of work to be done much of it is being done um but again i, I do think that at this particular moment the potential for convincing or perfect deep fakes is outpacing our countermeasures i can see one last question in the chat which is more about what can individuals do today to mitigate harm to the images, if there is anything that we can do. Very difficult question. Well, maybe uh, to throw in a positive question is, um, or a, a positive spin to the whole story is that um, these models rely on many data points. No, so like the less data points are available of you, um, the less accurate these models will represent you. 
for now, you know, we we are we are close to uh, one shot learning where only few data points are needed. Uh, but I think at the moment, right now, the best you can do don't put as much as possible on um, in terms of data on the internet. Um, the less data points somebody can grab of you, the less uh, precise they can adjust the models to your likeness. And um, maybe as a general rule, don't spread what you don't really have to spread on the internet. No. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I would add, um, you know, there are some common uh, countermeasures here that we can all exercise as individuals. Now, as, as artists and photographers and creators, I think there's a, a, a more grave responsibility to make sure that um, you're transparent about how things are made and, and what, and, and be very careful about using these tools um, that might be conflated with news content, even using tools like Lightroom, you know, ensuring that um, everyone adheres to, uh, ethical standards of information integrity like the Associated Press and AFP and others have. Um, but as a consumer, I think, you know, it's incumbent upon us all and probably especially those of us with children and grandchildren and relatives um, to make sure that more common kind of work a day techniques to decide whether to pass something on, share it, or frankly judge whether it's true or not or taken. And that means pausing. And I know, you know, all the platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Meta, and others um, have done lots of experiments with interventions. But I would urge us all to to put forth our own interventions, saying if we think something is news, let's let's do the simple things to decide for ourselves whether it's trusted or not. Let's look at the source. Um, let's make sure that these aren't miscontextualized. Let's do a reverse image search sort of as the next escalation to make sure that um, something that appears to be news or appears to be from our favorite news source actually is and isn't a miscontextualized photo from 10 years ago. And I think we start with news content because that's those are the things that impact our kind of day to day lives and our attitudes and the way we interact with each other. Um, and that can be done now. And things like provenance technology will make that easier and uh, we can do it with more confidence. So do these things now that are simple, look out for accretive tools that help us do it better in the next couple of years. Thanks, thanks a lot, Andy. I think that's a great positive note um, on which we can end this panel discussion um, in light of time. I would like to thank our speakers again very much for your great contributions and also everyone in the audience for tuning in and for your curious questions and thoughts. We'd be very grateful if you could fill out the event evaluation form that my colleague will drop in the chat in a bit. It's only a short questionnaire. It would help us tremendously to improve the quality of our events. I'd like to conclude um, by saying that we've established throughout the entire conversation that text to image generation is indeed reshaping the integrity of media content. We haven't really seen or haven't found this technology in global disinformation campaigns yet. It's quite new still, and partly also because of the fact that its full technological potential is not developed, but there is a strong likelihood that at some point with evolving technology, we can narrow this gap between truly authentic content and fake but relatively plausible content. Does this mean we're doomed? No, um, it's not all doom and gloom. I think that's something that we can derive from this conversation today. Obviously, first of all, if we look at the artistic point of view, but also we do have solutions, they are not out of sight. So even in the context of disinformation, there's something that we can do about it. We can educate ourselves, but we can also educate audiences to understand what to look out for, when media content appears to be fishy to fact check information that we receive online. We've mentioned that there are technical solutions such as the authentication at the point of creation, but it's also very valuable to have technical standards and codes of conduct and practices that the AI service providers only need to adhere to ideally. And lastly, it's always good to have an ecosystem and network such as this one that actually closely follows and monitors synthetic media development and can then also inform the public and the regulatory debate. With that, I'd like to thank everyone again for participating, especially the speakers again, Claire, Andy, Jan, and also Sharon, who has already left. Thanks so much again for being here. And to everyone else, have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And yeah, see you at our next event. Thank you.